It's just beautiful when a new dad gets to torment his kids with all the awful jokes he learned from his father. <sighs> I love pop culture. Do me a favor. Go ahead and search for your generation name on YouTube. Millennial, Gen X, Zoomer, whatever. Don't worry, it'll just be me talking for a bit. Just try a quick little search for me in another tab. Odds are, you'll find an impressive number of skits, songs, think pieces, and jokes emphasizing all the ways you are better or worse than people who were born outside of a certain window on either side of you. If you're between 28 and 43 years old, for example, there are hundreds upon hundreds of videos calling you out for being an emotionally fragile, immature, phone-addicted narcissist, or maybe calling out some other age range for being even worse. Intergenerational beefs and commentary are a popular genre for authors and YouTubers who need some reliable bait for engagement, and it's not hard to see why. Poking fun at some stereotype of a large demographic of people as technologically illiterate or nihilistic or whatever never fails to set the comments ablaze with indignant retorts and flag-waving. Modern generation theory was conceived in the 1920s by sociologist Carl Mannheim in an attempt to bridge the explanatory gap between large-scale social changes and the individuals who drive those changes. It's clear that societies and history are continuously shaping people, and that those people are constantly shaping their societies and historical events in turn. But in that confusing non-stop royal of forces and feedback loops, it can be hard to make any sense of that process, or tease out trends that might help us predict which way things are headed. Mannheim proposed we could get our bearings by taking a page from Karl Marx and defining society in terms of blocks of people who share a sort of collective identity, a feeling of camaraderie and shared destiny stemming from a common background and experiences. In theory, bundling individuals into clusters of like-minded peers would give sociologists a more tractable problem to solve, reducing the noisy stochastic soup of social change to something more manageable, a handful of generational actors, the relationships between them, and the historical events that prompt them to respond. In practice, there have been some issues. Because generations are defined by age and historic era, it's impossible to disentangle alleged generational features from either of those factors individually. Like, say that you discover that Zoomers are statistically less likely to get their news from CNN. Is that because there's something about identifying as a Zoomer that includes avoiding CNN? Or is it because CNN isn't prioritizing new viewership in 2024? Because their reporting has gone downhill since 2020 and only legacy readers have stuck around. The supposed generational effect might contribute to a drop in CNN viewership among Zoomers, but we can never separate it from when we're measuring and how old they are. That vagueness means generational features can be invoked to explain just about any deviation from the status quo without fear of being proven wrong. Like, Millennials and their bad table manners are killing the napkin industry. This isn't to say there aren't meaningful differences between the median 20-year-old in 1994 versus a 20-year-old today. But if you're trying to make predictions about how Zoomers will behave in the future, you'd have to be pretty confident about which phenomena could be attributed to their gestalt psychology and which were just coincidental intersections of age and history. The supposed explanatory power of generations is even less convincing when it comes into conflict with other categories that predict different outcomes. Attitudes about gender are more closely linked to political party affiliation than generational cohort. The ease of transitioning from working in an office to working from home wasn't best predicted by whether you were a technologically inept boomer or a tech-savvy millennial, but by whether you had to share your home-slash-workplace with young children. The ecological catastrophe descending around us could be blamed on boomers and their callous disregard for the future, but boomers spearheaded the modern environmentalist movement and the Clean Air Act, and surprisingly few were shot callers at ExxonMobil in the 80s. Generational explanations aren't just a worse way to understand these phenomena, they're an obstacle to understanding them at all. These issues may help explain why the tide is turning against the use of generations as an explanatory device. In 2021, sociologist and demographer Philip N. Cohen wrote an open letter to Pew Research, urging them to abandon generational categories in their work, arguing that they're confusing, arbitrary, unscientific, and that their use in scientific papers has misled the public about their legitimacy. After years of internal consideration and consulting numerous experts, Pew Research pointedly reversed their position on the use of generations in demographic analysis in 2023, saying, 
Generational studies have been flooded with content that's often sold as research, but it's more like clickbait or marketing mythology. They issued guidelines warning other research institutions away from that framework, and have stated that their policy going forward will be to invoke generations sparingly, if at all, and only if they can't find any other way to characterize the phenomena they're measuring. Quite a 180 from the folks who used to help set the thresholds for who counts as which generation. This leads us to an obvious question. What took so long? Generation theory has been with us a long time, but the problems and critiques have also been apparent from the get-go. Why, in 2024, do corporations still spend millions of dollars on generational consultants to demystify their younger employees? Why do news stories written 100 years after Mannheim continue to lump 28-year-olds in with 43-year-olds as though they have some deep connection that 44-year-olds could never truly understand? In a 2013 article, sociologist Jonathan White suggests the answer might be due to a phenomenon he calls generationalism, an appeal to generational framing when discussing social and political issues to exploit a couple rhetorical advantages. First, it can be used to color things with a sense of dramatic gravity. Second, it can act as a convenient vehicle for all sorts of political agendas. White suggests that generationalism can be a great way to imbue otherwise innocuous stuff with outsized historic importance. If you point out that some kids use words like riz or yacht to joke around with each other, yeah, people make up new slang sometimes, news 11. If you instead suggest that Generation Alpha has rejected conventional language and communicates exclusively using internet-based vocabulary, it's easier to get folks riled up about it. Every little thing that people of different ages do or experience differently can be made into an omen for the direction civilization itself is trending. Of course, nobody decides which things to emphasize like that at random. They pick and choose phenomena that reinforce their assumptions about the world. Sometimes that effect is subtle. Saying millennials' lives are defined by their relationship to the September 11th World Trade Center attacks reinforces the idea that it was a singular, pivotal event in world history. Sometimes it's not so subtle. Pepsi is the choice of a new generation. This notion of selective emphasis also helps to explain why generational stereotypes tend to develop around certain highly visible demographics. Avocado toast was not, in fact, the chosen breakfast meal of millennials living in poverty, but it was a convenient rhetorical device to paint people of a certain age bracket as decadent. White also argues that generationalism is a useful tool for certain political agendas, carving the electorate into smaller groups and pitting them against each other to clear the way for programs of institutional change. He cites the very deliberate stereotyping of baby boomers as prosperous, hedonistic, politically powerful, and selfish as a tactic to get UK citizens on board with dismantling social welfare for the elderly, framing pensions and such as unjust redistribution of wealth from hard-working millennials and Gen Xers to freeloading entitled boomers who never had to work for anything. Of course, phasing out those programs would just shift the burden of care for aging parents onto their kids, not to mention that many freeloading boomers busted their asses to make ends meet while funding those programs. But it's much easier to sell the story that everyone between the ages of 60 and 78 is uniquely undeserving of government benefits if you suggest their collective identity is being selfish. White also notes that when generationalism is in play, it draws attention away from other possible groupings of people. Like when journalists report on housing, they often frame it as a generational thing, saying something like, younger generations can't buy property the way boomers could when they were the same age. This paints the housing problem as an issue of generational injustice. Boomers could afford houses earlier. It's not fair that millennials have had to rent until they're in their 30s and 40s. But generational differences are less predictive of homeownership than things like class or race. And an increasing number of people over the age of 55 are staring down the barrel of housing insecurity and homelessness, none of which fits the generational grievance narrative. By characterizing the problem in those terms, Articles draw attention away from the much larger underlying problems of structural racism and growing wealth inequality. It's understandable why a news agency might not want to touch those politically charged topics, but feeding vague intergenerational beefs instead is actively corrosive to understanding or grappling with the real issues. Which leads us back to that little experiment we did at the beginning of this episode. In a way, generations are hazily defined totems we use as vessels for our complicated feelings about time, history, and change. We pour our anxiety and hope about technology in the future into newer generations, 
and our nostalgia and dissatisfaction with the state of politics in the world into older ones. In that light, the YouTubers sniping at each other about side parts and skibbity toilets are really just blowing off steam about historical and cultural forces beyond their control. But it's worth noting how that catharsis comes at a cost. Invoking these unscientific categories again and again doesn't just surrender any hope of explaining why things are the way they are in meaningful ways. It distracts us from the things we do have the power to change, dividing us along arbitrary lines that make it harder to recognize what we have in common and what problems we have to solve together, regardless of whether we were born before or after the release of Mist. Are generations overused in explanations of social phenomena? What other categories do you find more useful in explaining the course of history and the death of the diamond industry? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah, blah, subscribe, blah, share, and don't stop thunking.